We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. For even Christ did not please himself, but it, it is written, The insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the endorsement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus. So that with one heart and mouth we may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Together, accept one another. Then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Amen. Today I want to talk about uh, loving one another, the purpose of becoming a church. And so today's points are very simple. I want to break it down to two main things. What Paul, Apostle Paul writes um, to, uh, writing about like what we, we shouldn't do um, as a church and what we ought to do. And of course, our goal is to be like verses 6 and 7. So that we can really go forth before God to be more like Christ so that he, His name can be praised. Amen? I mean, I hope that's the goal that you're here today. And so um, today I just want to talk about uh, what Apostle Paul is saying and how we can become a church in unity. How we can be a better church uh, for Christ. Um, to kind of, when you read the Bible, you always should consider not just reading that section of the Bible, but trying to put things in context, right? To try to understand what's going on and why the writer is trying to write what he's writing. Okay? So if you look, um, chapter 14 and 15 is a continuation. We naturally just automatically think when a new chapter starts, it's a new thought that is beginning. But here we see Apostle Paul writing from chapter 14, and he's continuing his thought into chapter 15. And the book of Romans, from chapter 12, it's talking about how Apostle Paul is telling the people to go and pray, um, to live your lives in practical ways so that you can glorify God. That's the main purpose of um, him writing from chapter 12 until the end of the book. And so the thought that he's trying to convey the church, um, the people in Rome, is this. In chapter 14, the church, there has been some uh, miscommunication and, and um, unity has been broken. Right? People coming up with their selfishness, and there starts to be divisions within the church. Now, what are they actually fighting about? In chapter 14, if you read it, it talks about some people are becoming vegetarians, and some people are meat lovers. How many of you are vegetarians? Wow. How many of you are meat lovers? Don't lie. Don't be ashamed. We all like meat, right? I, I was like a vegetarian when I was in middle school. Uh, all throughout high school, but I can't really say I was a vegetarian because I ate meat secretly. Um, I don't know what I was doing, but it was like so conditional. Anyway, um, some people like to just eat vegetables, right? What the issue here was, people were saying, look, there were food that was being sold by the Gentiles, these Jewish, Jewish people, they were saying, it's so unclean. You can't be eating that stuff. But part of the church is like, well, what does that matter? God has given us this freedom. For, a, for us to be able to eat what we can, right? God has given us that freedom. And so there was that division within the church. Not only that, were they fighting about food, about being vegetarians and meat lovers, but they're fighting about holidays. Hey, Christmas is, starts only on this day and this season. No, Christmas is something that we celebrate. The birth of Jesus Christ should be an everyday process that we should really honor God through. And so within the church in Rome, people were being split into two divisions. But one thing that God really absolutely hates is he hates division in the church. Right? He doesn't like division. And to kind of give you a couple of Bible verses that kind of talk about how God really loves unity within the body of Christ. If you look at Psalm 133, 1 and 2, it says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for the brothers to dwell together in unity. There's a lot of verses that talk all throughout the Bible of being unison, in unity in the body of Christ. Acts chapter 2, we see the early Christian church coming together, serving one another, really loving one another, to the point where they were able to sell their possessions to be able to help others in need. Right? They used uh, unity as the main function that really drove the church together. Okay? There are also verses in like Ephesians chapter 3, where it says, in, uh, 
Enduring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. It talks about keeping the unity and peace within one another. Right? There are other verses, 1 Corinthians 1.10, Philippians 1.27, and on and on and on. The Bible talks about the importance of unity. So now, going back to our text in Romans, how much division that uh, people were creating was really disrupting the body of Christ was really kind of what Apostle Paul was wanting to mention and write about. Saying, look, you guys are you guys are arguing about such nonsense things, such dumb issues that it's not important. What you should really come together and really, um, the purpose of the church is to really honor God and to glorify God, right? And so that is the thought process, the background in chapter 14, what Apostle Paul has been writing about. And then we get to chapter 15, he wants to really drive home that point of be having unity with the body of Christ and what we ought to do, right? Okay. So if you look at verses 1 and 2, uh, let me read it again. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not please ourselves. He's talking about the strong and the weak. Now he's not just talking about physical people, right? People who are big in stature and muscular. You shouldn't look down upon like weak people and, and, and do things like that. It's talking about the measure of faith. People who are stronger in faith, who have been really walking with God and, and meditating upon his word and trying to live by his word according to his word. People who are living in this way have, are, are stronger Christians. They have a better, deeper understanding in the heart of God. And so he's talking about these people, people who are strong in their faith. You should not look down upon people who are weak in their faith and kind of point fingers and judge them in this way, right? Why people were doing this, he says at the end of verse 1, he says, to please ourselves. So a lot of people were coming to church and making all these points and arguments because they wanted to please themselves. You know, if you look at it, people do that in, the, in this world, right? We want to kind of make our points, to make our case, to drive home something, to make ourselves know. This is how much I know, this is how I am right, and you're wrong. And we love that feeling, don't we? Of, of feeling right. Yes? Am I the only, like, crazy, selfish person here? <laughs> I mean, we, we love it when we are correct and other people are wrong and we can kind of, yeah, that's right. Right? I mean, I mean and this is what people were doing in, within the church. Saying, I have a stronger faith. I'm, I walk with God. You don't. You don't know anything yet, so I'm kind of going to look down upon you. Why? Not for the sake of really building the church and bringing unity within, but for the sake of glorifying themselves, for pleasing themselves. So themselves are, are the main point here. And this is what Apostle Paul says, you shouldn't be doing. This needs to be broken in order for you to have unity. This has to be broken, the selfishness of, our, of yourself within the church. Now think about it. We live in such a selfish, self-centered culture today where everything is all about us, right? all about me, myself, and I. As long as I'm happy, everything is fine. As long as I go to church and, and you know, I hear the word that's kind of helpful to me, oh, I had a good service. As long as we come, I come to church and we sing the songs that I know, oh yeah, I like the song. I know the song. Oh yeah, it's all about me. It's not really about thinking about worshiping God and glorifying God and trying to keep the unity of one another, but it's really self-centeredness. Right? And so these strong Christians, what they were doing is going around making these cases, making these points, saying, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong, oh, you don't know how to do that, right? And Paul is really speaking against that. Now think about it. Everybody has a different time of maturity, right? We've been talking, for those of you who don't know, we have been talking about growing in Christ, to have uh, maturity in Christ, to not just be where we are always in, a, in this circle of going through the spiritual highs and lows, but learning to really having the Word of God deeply planted in our hearts and being able to grow, what it really means to mature. And so if you look at it, people have different points and different timings of maturity. The person next to you might be really digging into, into God's Word and growing a lot quicker, or have been really meditating um, and being able to really draw uh, strength from the Lord through the Word when you feel like, oh, I don't really understand, I don't really know what's going on. So we have all different times of maturing, maturing times. And yet, none of us should be the point where we go around, point fingers to other people saying, you don't even know that? Oh, you're not like this, you're not like that? And I kind of made that mistake. 
let me give you an example. When I was in college, I came to, I grew up as a PK, um, brief summary. I grew up as a PK. Uh, my dad's the oldest of six. Uh, he's a pastor, and all his brothers became pastors. And so I grew up in a really Christian family. But sad thing is I, I myself didn't really begin to walk with God and have a relationship with God until end of my sophomore year in college. And so um, that's when I really begin to really invest in God and really see that God was really real and working in my life. And so um, by my senior year in college, I became a Bible study leader. And at that point, I was gathering all these freshmen that were coming into college. These freshmen don't know anything. Let me just take care of them. Let me be the one to guide them and lead the way so that they don't fall into these other sins or whatever. Right? And some of you might be thinking about these freshmen that are sitting here right now. Um, but as I, as I was having Bible study with them, I was like, listen, these are the memory verses that you need to know. As a Christian, you have to know these uh, Bible verses. Right? So next week, I'm going to quiz on you and... If you don't get it right, no meal for you to pay. Um, and so I kind of had a strict uh, restriction and held them to a higher standard. And so as I was doing this, I realized some kids couldn't memorize. You know, some kids were having a difficult time with these memory verses and, and even bringing the Bible to the Bible, uh, Bible studies. And I was like, what's wrong with you guys? And I was kind of being harsh on them. But that's when God really spoke to me and says, John, stop trying to form them in the image of who you are, right? Everyone has different levels and different timings of maturity in the ways that God works in them. It's not all about what you want to do, what you want to accomplish, what you think is right to really impose upon them. If I'm not really encouraging them to really grow in Christ and to seek Christ more, then I am at fault. I am the one sinning. I'm not really doing a service to the unity of the body of Christ. And so God broke me at that point, speaking directly to me and saying, stop forming people to be more like you, but rather start forming people and point, point them towards me. Right? We are all made in the image of Christ. Amen? That was so weak, man. <laughs> we are made in the image of Christ. Amen? Amen. Okay, so you guys know that, right? And so... As we, we understand this, we begin to have a mindset that every person is different. The person next to you might be going through different situations and, and, and you know, the, the different timing and the, and the mood that they're going through as they woke up this morning than how you're feeling. You come to church all excited, wanted to worship God, and oh yeah, but the person next to you is like, oh man, I'm so tired. I wanted to sleep 30 more minutes. Oh, why did my, my dad, you know, like not drive me to church? I had to take a bus and subway and oh. You know, we all go through different things in life. We all are broken in different situations in life, right? We're all broken people, and yet God looks down upon us, and he says, you know what? I want you to grow in the time that I have set up for you. You know, individually. Thank, praise God that God did not make us to be robots, that everybody goes to the same exact experiences and situations, and at this time, you know, February 2nd week, we experienced this, and everyone is exactly the same. But praise God that God has made us to be individuals, all different in the character of God, but yet at the same time made in the image of God. How crazy is that, right? We're all created in the image of God. And so it's our job to really seek after God, say, God, how do you want me to grow for you? How can I really grow in your word? You know? And we are all in different situations. So therefore, people who are stronger in your faith, you, should, you shouldn't be the one to impose your thoughts, your ways, how you have grown in Christ upon other people. That's not your job. Right? My job here as a pastor is not to really tell you so that you can become more like me. Look at me and how I am really serving God and how I'm really loving God this way. And you shouldn't do that for the teachers either. You shouldn't look at anybody saying, oh, I need to be more like them. No. But my job as a pastor and teachers, our job is to really live our lives to the best of our ability to represent Christ so that you guys may be able to see how great our God is, how great His love is that He can transform someone like me to even be up here to really share God's word with you. Right? It's all about Christ and how He has brought people to really grow in this way 
in this type of maturity. Right? And so for those of you who right now, maybe oh, you feel like you have been really, this is a season for you that you have been really growing in faith, don't look at these freshmen that come in and say, yeah, these freshmen, they don't know anything, so I got to kind of like tell them and let them know and, and tell them that STEM is like this and they have to do certain things. No. I mean, yeah, you have to let them know to the point that you can guide them to encourage them, as the word says today, right? To endure with patience and to encourage them so that they can be more like Christ. But you should never try to impose your own thoughts and how God has brought you upon them. Because God has other plans for each individual. And so this is what Apostle Paul is saying. saying stop arguing over stupid things that don't even matter. Right? Whether you're a vegetarian or a meat eater, whatever. God still loves you and see how God has brought you and God is bringing each individual in different seasons of life. Be able to embrace that and be set an example. And therefore, from this point, what does Apostle Paul do? He points out in verse, from verses 3 and on, saying you're, you should be able to look upon Christ and see how he's the one who has set the example for us. And when we begin to strive after Christ in this way, then we can truly have unity in the body of Christ. Right? In order for us to really have unity in the body of Christ, it really has to start with you. It really has to start with you in a way that you don't come to church, a place where broken people who are in need of God's grace and His love come thinking that you're all righteous because you've been here for a while, thinking that you're all good because you have been going to church for a long time. None of those things really matter. It's really about where you are in your relationship. How much do you know God? How much are you really striving in your life to, to represent Him? In the ways that you speak to one another, in the ways that you treat one another, how is Christ being seen in your life? That has to be the number one thing. Right? That's what we strive for. And when we begin to do that upon, upon in the midst of a group of believers, think about how our church as a whole can really grow. Church should not be a place where, you know, you want to come and worship God, but yet you're being so distracted because people around you are thinking, oh my gosh, look what she's wearing today. Oh my God, he didn't even wash today. Oh, why is he sitting next to me? Right? And start judging people on their exterior, you know, you know, what you see with your eyes. But that has to be broken. That self-centeredness has to be broken. And yet we pray for something like this. We say, God, help me to see others as you see them. Is how you love them. Right? I mean, if we don't begin to do this and have this type of mindset at heart, what is the difference of us being here as a church and people just non-believers who do not know Christ just gathering for a meeting? Just gather, gather together and they just come and sing a couple of songs and they just listen to somebody talk for a little bit and then, and then they go home. Right? What is the difference? And that's the biggest thing today. The biggest challenge for today in society is that there isn't a clear difference between the people of God who go to church and people who don't go to church who do not know God. And that's such a sad reality. But what about you in your everyday life? Can there be a very clear distinction in your life in the way you speak, in the way you act, when you treat your other people around you, that people know that there's something different about that you are a believer and a follower of Christ, that you really represent Christ in this way. I mean, this is what we ought to be. And so we begin to see that from verse 3 of how Apostle Paul mentions of how Christ is the ultimate example. So look, what, look with me on verse 3. Okay. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. So Paul, Apostle Paul says, for even Christ did not please himself. This is what we ought to be, like Philippians 2. I love that passage where Christ came into the world. He humbled himself, he lowered himself to the point of coming into the world, to the point of um, being born in a manger, right? He talks about this really humbling God that he is to the point of dying upon us, for us upon the cross. Right? This is the kind of mindset and attitude um, that we are called to have. And so he was very selfless in, in this way. Verse 4, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures that we might have hope. So we have encouragement and we're able to endure and truly striving and pursuing after Christ 
Not just out of thin air, but, but through the word of God. Amen? And the word of God tells us what Christ has done. Right? We're so undeserving of this, but Christ is the one who humbled himself to the point of the cross. He came when he did not have to die that death, that gruesome death that he died, but he did so thinking about each and every one of you. One of, of me too. Right? All of us included. Thinking about us. Saying, you know what? Their lives are worth it. And so I'm going to get out of my comfort zone, go down into the world, die, die this death that God is calling me to do on behalf of them so that they can begin to have life, so that they can begin to live, so that they can begin to have access to the Father. And this is what Christ has really done. Verse 5, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus. So this is what Paul now, he's, he's beginning to tell them what you need to focus, shift your focus from, not to yourself, but focus on Christ. And now he's, in verse 5, beginning to pray for these people, right? May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity. May God be the one to help you to have the mindset of unity amongst one another. Okay? Verse 6. Um, so that with one heart and one and so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. So the calling now, the command that Apostle Paul gives to his people, believers, is saying, accept one another. You need to accept one another to become that unity, the body of Christ. Why? For the purpose of glorifying and praising God. Now that is the goal of mankind, right? For us to live our lives, to really worship God, to glorify God, and to praise God. And so how do we do that? By us coming together in unity, saying, look, I want to be able to serve in the church. I want to serve others. I want to consider others better than myself. You know? Do you ever think this way, that before you say something, you think about how the other person hearing the words that you're going to say is going to take the words? Or do you just say, I don't care, it's all about me and I'm just going to say what I need to say so that I, I feel, oh, I feel good now. Right? It's not about just you. Sorry to bring it to you, but you know, you're not the center of the universe. Right? And everyone thinks like this. That, oh, it's all about me, and I'm the star of my show, and no one's going to stop me, and live for now, YOLO, right? And people are saying all these things in the world. It's all about you. Do what you feel. Do what you want. But that's not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible is such opposite way. The way that Christ set the example, it's not about me, but it's about how Christ came and started serving the people. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. This is a verse where we see the purpose of Jesus Christ. He came to not to be served, but to serve others as a ransom for many. This is the purpose why Christ came. He came to serve others, and He's calling us to do the same as we follow in His footsteps. Being able to consider, you know? And it starts with small things. Don't think that, oh, I'm going to start living like this when I grow up, and when I have a job, and when I have a family, and everything is set with life. No, but God is calling you to begin to do that now, to start maturing in your faith, to really grow in your faith by doing the small things, such as your speech. Right? And so something that I just mentioned, think about if I, oh, you might be frustrated with things, right? And think about, if I say these things to this person, is it really going to benefit them so that they can really grow in Christ, they can turn to Christ? Or is it just all about, oh yeah, I'm right, and that person is wrong, I have to let them know. So I feel good. It's not about you. That's what we have to really understand. That when we come to church, it's really not about you. But it's about how God wants to use a broken you, not a perfect you, but still bring you together so that He can be worshipped. So that He can begin to heal you. So that He can begin to show you the way. So that we can become unity. Uh, you, we can have unity amongst one another as a body of Christ. And that's what I pray for STEM, that as we receive these freshmen that come up from STEM middle thinking that, oh, we're the oldest, we get to do whatever we want, right? <laughs> right? Maybe they don't have that mindset, maybe they're too shy, I don't know. But think about the time that you were in, you know, in that situation, before you approach them, and, or not even approach them, say, they're not even worth my time. Right? Think about the time that you are a freshman, 
And you be the one to reach out to them and to show Christ-like love. Why? For the purpose of unity. Why? So that we as a body of Christ can really bring glory to God. Amen? Amen. That has to be the purpose. And that's how I want this, you know, God really wants this community to be. A body of believers where we don't distinguish each other, label each other as just, you're a freshman, you're a senior, you're this, you're that. But you're a child of God. And I want to be able to serve you. How can I really love you the way God has loved me? I hope this really becomes our mindset and our goal. And when we begin to do this, just think about how much we can really grow individually in faith, but also as a body of Christ. And this is what truly the heart of God is all about, to really have unity amongst the believers that come together. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for the cross. And Lord, we thank you for accepting people like us. And we thank you for loving us, Lord, uh, the way you do with your unconditional love. Lord, we pray that we may not be of just living our lives for ourselves and living in self-centeredness, in our selfish ways, even the way we, we conduct ourselves and act in church where we tend to look down upon people and want to impose our thoughts and our, our ideas upon them. But Lord, we pray that we may be broken, that we may, may be able to go before you and may you be the one that we point to so that we may all become more like you and have that mindset of unity, unity of your love that really binds us together, Lord, that we may not forget that. And in doing so, as we grow in your love, may we go out into the world and be able to share this love that you have given us and shown us, Lord, to really show the world of your heart for them. So Lord, I ask that you may continue to challenge our hearts and be with us to really strive, to really go after the unity that you set before us. We thank you for your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.